Welcome to tonight's virtual CJD Foundation conference session with Dr. Brian Appleby and the team from the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. If you have questions during the program, you can type them into the box to the right of your screen and we'll review as many as we can after the presentation. We hope you'll also join us for upcoming virtual conference sessions, which will be listed on our website. We're pleased to have Dr. Appleby and his team with us for this presentation. As you probably know, the center is an important part of the prion disease community. The prion center performs tests and autopsies to diagnose prion disease, and they conduct important CJD research. And equally as important, they serve as a vital repository for prion disease tissue samples and they make those samples available as they collaborate with researchers from around the world. You may have heard Professor Simon Mead refer to one of those studies and their collaboration with the center last week. This is why we families advocate so regularly with our legislative representatives to ensure that the CDC and the Prion Center continue to be funded for prion surveillance. Without that funding, our country would not have adequate prion surveillance and would not have the tissue bank to enable prion research. If you'd like to help by contacting your legislative representatives, please contact us at help at cjdfoundation.org or call us and request a template to send to your rep representatives. Dr. Appleby is a neuropsychiatrist he studied at Georgetown, practiced at Johns Hopkins, and is now Associate Professor at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. He's the Director of the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center, and I'm grateful to say that he's also the Medical Director of the CJD Foundation. We're fortunate to be able to call on him regularly to speak with families and answer questions. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Brian Appleby. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much to the foundation for allowing us to present uh, an update on the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. Uh, before we go over what we do, um, I wanted to reflect a little bit on what the CJD Foundation Family Conference means to us. Of course, we're very sad that we weren't able to come in person and see everyone, but oftentimes when things don't happen, you reflect on what you miss and what it means to you. So for me, uh, very clearly, it means the people. So I very much miss seeing everyone. And hopefully, you will bear with me during this presentation, because hopefully, we do meet in person next year. And I can show you some of the perks of coming to the conference. And you can see some of the hilarity that ensues from the last conferences. The other thing, too, is and like other conferences that are being recorded for this virtual conference, um, we do expect that there will be some basic understanding of prion disease, which you may or may not have, or you may actually want more detail than what we're presenting on. So if that's the case, there are two primary resources that I would recommend. The first, of course, is the CJD Foundation's website, which has a lot of text information, but also they have very good recorded videos and presentations that are on general principles of prion disease, but also very specific aspects of prion disease. And you can certainly find them and listen to them and watch them at the foundation's website. Then the second resource I would recommend is the Surveillance Center's website, which more recently is being updated to include a little bit more educational information than what it once had. What are we gonna go over today? First, I'll review some of the purpose and activities of the center. I'll present a little bit of data that we've collected from the Prion Surveillance Center over the last year. I'll summarize some of the research projects that we've done in the last year. And I really wanna also emphasize the importance of the patients, the families, and the CJD Foundation to us. And then finally, at the very end, we're gonna have a question and answer, answer panel with Prion Center staff. This won't be recorded. So if you have personal questions, please don't be alarmed. It's not gonna be recorded. It's not gonna be posted on the website, but of course, everyone else on the call will be able to hear it. So what does the Prion Surveillance Center do? We were started in 1997 under uh, Dr. Pierluigi Gambetti 
at Case Western Reserve University located in Cleveland, Ohio, and it was largely in response to variant CJD, which is CJD due to eating meat contaminated by mad cow disease. So in the mid-1990s, that was pretty much in the middle of the mad cow or bovine spongiform encephalopathy epidemic. And in 1996 is when we started noticing clues that would suggest that mad cow disease was being transmitted to humans. So at that time, the United States, as well as other countries, developed more sophisticated surveillance centers to monitor this. The Prion Surveillance Center is funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, and our primary goal is to collect and analyze brain tissue to assist the CDC in their surveillance. And there's two, way, two reasons why we do that, right? why there's a brain uh, tissue-based surveillance. So the first way is the only way to definitively diagnose prion disease is by actually looking at the brain tissue itself. As we'll see later, we have pretty good tests for diagnosing prion disease in people that are living, but it's still the only way to definitively diagnose it. And perhaps more importantly, it's really the only way to really accurately determine the type of prion disease. So as a review, there's four types, the most common of which is sporadic, meaning that it just happens for reasons that we don't understand. There's the genetic form due to a genetic mutation. There's the variant kind due to eating meat contaminated with mad cow disease. And then there's the iatrogenic kind through very specific medical procedures. So only through analyzing brain tissue can we determine the specific type of prion disease. And that's very important for CDC to do their surveillance work. It also allows CDC to really have a better understanding of disease patterns. So they look at disease clusters across the US. And one of the important things to know about that is whether or not those cases actually had prion disease. And if they did, what type of prion disease it was. Because obviously if you have a cluster of cases and two or three of them are genetic, then that kind of reduces the alarm that there was some type of contamination event causing the increase of cases in that area. And then finally, more and more, the surveillance center is focusing on chronic wasting disease, which is a prion disease of deer, elk, moose, and caribou that's fairly epidemic in North America. And we don't know whether it can be transmitted to humans. However, that's something that we're following very closely. And we have no evidence right now to suggest that it is being transmitted to humans. But unfortunately, as we know with these illnesses, there can be very long um, incubation period. So the time that someone is exposed to the disease to the time that they develop the disease. So we have to do this long term to really get a good answer of whether or not it's a threat to humans. And if you look at various basic science and animal research, fortunately, it looks like the risk of chronic wasting disease transmitting to humans is low, but it's clearly not 0%. So this is very necessary and why we continue to do surveillance. Again, the core of the Prion Surveillance Center is brain tissue-based surveillance for those reasons that I just reviewed. But we really have many other aspects of the center, but they all feed into this core principle. So the first thing is we can only do an autopsy on a case if we know that it's a suspected case of prion disease. So one way Dr. Gambetti really helped the fuel brain tissue-based surveillance is to give clinicians a diagnostic test to be able to say whether or not it's prion disease. So we do a variety of clinical diagnostic tests to help clinicians diagnose the disease. And we're gonna review them in detail later on. Then now, of course, the physician has to know when to do the clinical diagnostic tests. They have to know when to suspect the disease. So we have to educate and perform some type of outreach to inform people of that. And of course, they have to know that the autopsy program, which is free of charge from the CDC, is available to them and their patients. So that requires some degree of outreach and education. And finally, our surveillance system is a little bit unique in that we also really try to help the clinician make the diagnosis. So it's not uncommon for us to consult with a variety of partners, including clinicians, to help them with these cases. And then finally, of course, research is a pillar of the surveillance center. Most of surveillance related uh, research deals with things that would concern uh, the types of C uh, CJD and how frequent it is. But as you'll see later, we perform many other aspects of research. So reviewing the clinical diagnostic tests, as I said before, we basically do two types. One type 
is on cerebral spinal fluid or CSF. And we do three specific tests for clinicians. Two of those tests are just markers of brain cell damage. And that includes the 1433 and the tau proteins. These are just markers of brain cell damage. So they will be elevated in other conditions. And that's important to remember that sometimes you will see elevated levels in things like a seizure disorder or maybe even Alzheimer's disease. So they're not very specific for prion disease itself, but they're helpful. Fortunately, we now have a prion disease specific test because it actually captures very small amounts of prion proteins in the spinal fluid called real-time quaking induced conversion or RT quick. And we'll talk a little bit about that later because it's really been helpful, not just for diagnosis, but also for surveillance. We also perform genetic testing of the prion protein gene and we do this for two reasons. So we can do it on blood or brain tissue, and we look to see if whether or not there are mutations in the prion protein gene that causes the genetic forms of the illness, but we also look at a very specific part of the prion protein gene called codon 129 that has three different flavors that we all carry. These don't cause the disease, but they have very important impl implications for how the disease manifests. So it affects things like age of onset, duration, what the disease looks like clinically, and what it looks like underneath the microscope. So outreach and education. The foundation is really helpful for this. So they really help us uh, schedule what's called grand rounds, which are usually weekly, sometimes a little less frequently, where a department typically, neurology, medicine, psychiatry, will talk about a specific topic, and they get continuing medical education credits, which they need to maintain in order to keep their license. So the foundation sponsors grand rounds from around the country, and that allows us to educate people about prion disease and the various resources available to them in this country. <clears throat> we also assist others with information. So the CJD Foundation does a spectacular job of trying to spread as much information as they can that's accurate about CJD, and we often help them formulate that information at the very least um, fact check. We also try to distribute education in the form of publications. So that could be online resources like our website or something called Up to Date, which is a clinical database that a lot of clinicians use to help with patient management. We often will write book chapters or review articles on prion disease, again, to try to get that information out there. As I said earlier, we really are trying to ramp up our website to be a little bit more educational. Families come to our website, but also a lot of clinicians, public health department uh, people, as well as laboratories come to our website. And we really want to try to make it more of an educational resource for people. So that's currently in the works. And of course, you really can't discount just speaking with other people. Uh, and we do this in a variety of ways. Of course, when we're not socially distancing, we're meeting with them in person, but we also talk to a lot of people on the phone. So this is an example of Danielle and Aaron from the Prion Center going to the International Alzheimer's Disease Conference to help educate behavioral neurologists, geriatric psychiatrists on, of course, another form of dementing illness, prion disease. And then this is Kyle, Katie, and Megan a couple of years ago, going to the International Neurology Conference to help uh, neurologists be aware of the Prion Center and the foundation resources available to them. Consultations. We do this a lot with state public health departments. We share all our information with them to help them with their surveillance activities. Uh, but oftentimes they'll call us with specific questions about some of the diagnostic tests, or maybe they want to go over a case that they have questions about. We get a lot of calls from physicians. They want help in interpreting diagnostic test results, or they may actually uh, want to talk about a case and get some information on maybe what should they be doing next. We have the MRI consultation project, which we'll go over a little bit in detail later, where a uh, family member or a clinician can submit a CD copy of the brain MRI. And Dr. Beasy from Italy will read it for us, and then they send the clinician a report. And this helps, I think, a lot of times a clinician get a more accurate diagnosis of an MRI when maybe they're not used to seeing MRIs of prion disease patients. And then there's the Teleneurology Research Project, which isn't part of the Surveillance Center per se, but it really helps the Surveillance Center 
because we enroll people that have a uh, diagnosis of prion disease. We walk the family through what's going on. We collect clinical data, but very importantly, we are able to talk to the family and educate them about the importance of things like autopsy. And in our experience, having those personal conversations really help the family feel comfortable in endorsing a lot of those projects. Research. Most of the center-based research is going to be surveillance-based. So what that means is identifying and classifying subtypes of prion disease. One of our main purposes is to try to determine whether or not there are new forms of prion disease coming up, for example, chronic wasting disease in people. So we're looking at cases, make sure that they fit in certain subtypes that we're aware of. And if there's an atypical or an unusual form of prion disease that comes our way, we try to figure out if there's a reason for that or if it's something that's new that we've not seen before. Of course, we really want to develop better diagnostic tests. And as you'll see later, we continue to do that, not just for brain uh, tissue-based diagnostics, but also clinical diagnostics. Case Western has a lot of prion disease researchers. I think we attract a lot because of the surveillance center there. A lot of these prion researchers also serve a role within the center, and we really try to help them as much as we can with their research. We, of course, collaborate with outside researchers. If you heard Simon Mead's talk, you'll see that the Surveillance Center shared a large amount of samples uh, with his group in order for them to do their genetic analysis of sporadic CJD. But we really do collaborate with researchers from around the world because it's important that we share this information because it's such a rare disease. And of course, sometimes they don't just want data, but they need the tissue to do their analysis. So we also um, share that as well. Of course, all de-identified, um, but we share the necessary information and tissue that they need for their research. So the personnel at the center comprise faculty and staff. By faculty, we mean MDs and PhDs. Uh, there's myself and, of course, Dr. Mark Cohen, who's a neuropathologist, and he's been part of the center since it even started and clearly has seen more cases of prion disease underneath the microscope than anyone else in the world. And we have uh, Dr. Clive Hamlin and Dr. Jamie Nugas, who helps with the clinical lab and its oversight. Dr. Zell, who many of you have probably seen at prior conferences, who's presented his research, helps a lot with the protein analysis by looking at Western blots. Dr. Kong, who you'll hear, I, I believe, this year because of, he's a grant recipient. Um, he does a lot of work in chronic wasting disease, and he's been very helpful for looking at possible human aspects of the disease. And then recently, Dr. Callie has joined us, and he really is a jack of all trades and has been helpful in a variety of ways. Uh, he's very helpful for a lot of these atypical cases. Mark and I will go to him for, but he has a lot of technical expertise, and he's been very helpful for staff at trying to fine tune some of the assays that we have. We have about 15 staff members that can roughly be divided into administrative, dry lab, or bench lab, or wet lab staff. For the administrative staff, that includes people that do autopsy coordination, data entry, management, and of course, issuing test reports, among other things. And then the bench research or the wet lab includes the brain tissue test, which includes histology and protein analysis through Western blots, as well as clinical diagnostic tests. And as we said before, we really do aim to share a lot of tissue with people to the point where we actually have to have one person that can help get all those tissue requests together and sent out. And a lot of our staff help with that. Um, and a lot of their work goes into that um, because we do share so much. One of the things that the uh, foundation really helps the center with is keeping us funded. So as you know, um, oftentimes we're going to Capitol Hill to advocate for funding, not just for prion research, but for continued prion surveillance. And one of the things that we do is we invite staff members from our local representatives' offices to come in and give a tour of the center. And this is uh, the, the lady in the middle is one of those staff members from a representative's office. And the foundation is often here to also give the patient side of the story. And in critical times, we have been known to put them to work. And as you can see, they're going into the RT Quick Lab. And uh, this is how we're able to uh, stick to our turnaround times now. Sometimes we got to put Debbie and Lori to work. Okay, so we went over the purpose and activities of the center. I just briefly want to present some of the data collected 
from the center over the last year. And again, this is uh, information and data that you and your family have contributed to and we're very thankful for. And if you look at the brain tissue examined, this is all the brain tissue that's been sent to us since the inception of the Prion Center in 1997. Uh, you can see that roughly every year we get between 300, 400 referrals. Generally about 60 to 70% of cases are positive for prion diseases, which means that about 30 to 40% wind up being something else. And that could be anything from Alzheimer's disease. To unfortunately, sometimes we see treatable uh, diseases that come in being suspected of prion disease. As you would expect, about 90% of all these cases are sporadic, 10% are genetic, and very few are acquired. We haven't seen a case of variant CJD since 2014, and all four of the cases that we have seen are thought to have been acquired overseas. We still, however, do see iatrogenic CJD, mostly in the form of human growth hormone administrations from 40 plus years ago. And you can see that the second to last column, we had one case of iatrogenic CJD in 2018, and we've actually already had one case this year in 2020 as well. You'll see that generally over time, there's been an increase in referrals to the center. This is expected because the number one risk factor for sporadic CJD is age, and we do live in an aging population. However, we're also really trying to not be strict with accepting autopsies. So we really wanna try to accept cases that we really don't know what the diagnosis is. We don't wanna waste our funding. We don't wanna be doing autopsies on cases where it's clearly obvious to be something else. But if it's not very obvious that it's prion disease, but there really isn't any other explanation and prion disease is on the differential, we do wanna take those cases because we, again, we don't know what novel or new prion diseases will look like. If chronic wasting disease were to go into humans, we don't know what that would look like. And really the only way we're gonna know is by taking some of these questionable cases. So that's why you see the increase in numbers. You do see an increase in uh, prion disease in general over the years, but again, that would be expected from better diagnostic tests and also the aging of our population that we're screening. We started doing RT Quick on all CSF samples in the middle of 2015, and we've been tracking those cases since then. About every year we get an increase of 10 to 15% more CSF samples. So that's good. That means the word is getting out. Clinicians are using the test. What's interesting is despite the increase in sample number that we're receiving, pretty much routinely every year, about 10% of those samples are RT quick positive. Now again, RT quick is a very good test, but you can pretty much assume that almost all of those cases that are RT quick positive are prion disease. And as you can see, over the years, those numbers have been going up with increasing use of the test and, of course, increasing uh, aging of the population. By the way, all this stuff is kept up to date on the, CJ, uh, on the Prion Disease Surveillance Center's website under Quick Links. You can look at these tables. We update it quarterly if you want to follow along how we're doing each year. So a little aside, uh, these are some more pictures from the CJD Foundation Family Conference. Uh, your picture to the left is meant to demonstrate that all people can learn about prion disease, both big and small. And the picture to your right is Lori Nussbaum in, a, in basically a snapshot. This is a picture of us driving home from uh, the CJD Foundation Family Conference via cab to the airport. And Lori basically educated this cab driver all about prion disease. And he really knew a lot by the time we were done with our 15 minute uh, drive. So truly she's a great advocate for the field and she will teach anyone, including the cab drivers, whether or not they wanna hear it or not. We talked about some of the data that we collected. Now I'm just gonna touch on a few research projects that the Prion Center has done. We really have had a really good year for research, specifically when it comes to clinical diagnostics. That's important for surveillance because we're only gonna be able to get autopsies on patients that are suspected of having prion disease. So the first study that we did, which will be published this month, is looking at RT quick. Now, there have been several studies looking at RT quick and prion disease, but this is by far the largest. And we had a couple specific aims of this study. So we looked at 
spinal fluid samples from over 10,000 patients over the last three years, 567 of which went to autopsy. And that's important because autopsy is considered the gold standard. So anytime you look at how accurate a diagnostic test is, you want to compare it to the gold standard. In this case, it would be autopsy. And we had three primary questions for this study. Number one, how good of a test is RT Quick? Again, we've done this before. Other people have done this before. But now we have so many samples to look at. We really can get a pretty good idea of how good the test is. One of the important things that we knew from prior studies is that there is a subset of prion disease that actually is negative for RT Quick. We wanted to see if we could determine if there are characteristics that could predict that a case of CJD would have a negative RT quick result so that we could help clinicians in those scenarios. And then finally, what effect does RT quick have on prion disease surveillance? So it turns out RT quick's a pretty good test. And in order to demonstrate this, I'm going to go over a little bit of definitions. So when we look at the accuracy of a clinical test, we talk about two things, sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is how good your test is at capturing the disease you want to detect. So unfortunately, using the example of COVID-19, this is an example of you want to capture every single case of COVID-19 to keep everyone safe. So you want a very highly sensitive test. Then there's specificity, which is how good your test is at only capturing the disease that you want to detect. So again, looking at the COVID-19 example, you really only want to diagnose cases with COVID-19 as COVID-19 because otherwise people would have to quarantine for 14 days when they might not have the disease. Specificity is extremely important when you're talking about fatal diseases because you certainly don't want to give a diagnostic test result of a fatal illness to someone who does not have it. So in my opinion, specificity is by far the most important aspect of a disease-specific test like RT-QUIC. Even if it has to compromise sensitivity. But of course, we wanna to try to get as high as we can on both diagnostic aspects. So across all prion disease subtypes, RT Quick had a sensitivity about 90%. So what that means is we miss about 10% of cases. 10% of CJD cases will be negated by RT Quick. And then the specificity is very high at about 98.5%. So we only had one false positive in our autopsy sample, meaning that that case was RT quick positive, but at autopsy, it turned out being Alzheimer's disease. And again, we want a perfect test, but there's no such thing as a perfect test, but we really wanna limit um, any decrease in that specificity as much as possible. So it's a pretty good test when it comes to diagnostic tests in our, in our field. So what about those 10% of cases of CJD that wind up having a false negative RT quick? Is there anything we can learn from those? Well, one thing that we learned is that those 10 percenters were unusual and rare prion diseases. So if you look at the sporadic cases, these are the named weird sporadic illnesses called sporadic fatal insomnia, variably protease sensitive prionopathy, and very rare subtypes of sporadic CJD tended to be negative for 14 for, sorry, RT quick. And then some of the named genetic prion diseases tended to be negative for RT quick, and that includes fatal familial insomnia and Gershman straffler schenker disease. Interestingly enough, genetic CJD actually had the highest sensitivity for RT quick. 96% of genetic CJD cases were positive for RT quick. But for whatever reason, probably because they're just different strains, these named genetic prion diseases and these unusual sporadic cases were negative for RT quick. If you look at just the sporadic cases, there are a couple other things that popped out. One is that younger patients tended to be uh, negative for RT quick, and prion diseases of long duration over a year or more tended to also be negative for RT quick. Now, that's difficult to interpret because if you look at the unusual sporadic CJD cases, they tend to all be younger and have longer duration. So it's hard to determine whether or not the demographics of being younger and having a longer disease course is more important, or if it's just the unusual strain of the disease that's more important. And then we know that blood inhibits the RT-quick reaction, but even having just a little bit of blood 
in the spinal fluid that just discolors the sample a little bit will sometimes yield a false negative RT quick result. Now this is helpful because we can really help a clinician who swears that this is a case of prion disease, but the RT quick is negative. We can help them through this. So the third question that we had is, does RT quick help surveillance of prion disease? So at the center, you can do surveillance looking at just brain tissue. So if you look at this graph on the left-hand slide uh, side of the graph is incidence rate per million. So again, in prion disease, usually it's one to two per million per year. And then the horizontal axis is the year. The green columns are looking at the incidence of prion disease based just off of brain tissue examination. So if you just look at brain tissue in 2016, uh, prion disease had an incidence of 0.85 per year, uh, per million per year. But CDC recently updated its criteria for probable CJD, where now you only have to have a neuropsychiatric syndrome and a positive RT quick, and that's automatically considered a case of probable CJD. So now we can include laboratory-based probable cases of CJD. And if you take the autopsy cases and combine it with RT quick positive cases that didn't go to our autopsy, then you get those blue columns, which as you can see, increases the number of cases that you detect by about 90% or almost double. So in 2016, including RT quick, increased the incidence from 0.85 to 1.43. So it is really helpful for surveillance, not just because it helps with diagnosis, but now we have a laboratory-based uh, way that we can look at probable CJD. It's really hard to do in our country so we don't have a national healthcare system. Now, moving on to brain MRI, I'm touching on this because I know many of you uh, through referral from the foundation have sent us brain MRIs. And I'm very happy to say that uh, Dr. Beasy has been very productive in publishing data on your brain MRIs lately. So this was a um, article published this year looking at new criteria for detecting prion disease. That's much more sensitive than prior criteria, but there's a really important part of this study. And the important piece of this study is when you look at sporadic cases of CJD, all cases had either a positive MRI or a positive RT quick. So all cases of sporadic CJD were detected by one or the other, which is very important to know. And then Dr. Beasy has also been looking at other aspects of MRIs. Of course, when you get the brain tissue, it's after the disease has already run its course, but the brain MRI, you can actually get um, a little bit of a window into what's going on in the brain while the patient is still living. So some of this research is looking at how prion disease may propagate or move around the brain during the course of the illness. Again, moving on to the CJD Foundation Conference, everyone who comes to the conference has either um, had a loved one who died or has a loved one who has the disease. So that can be summed up in one word and that's courage. So we talked about research projects. Now we wanna talk about the importance of the patients, the families, and the foundation to what we do. We have a lot of key partnerships, of course the patients. We would hate for people to have CJD, we don't want that. But of course, we really need the patients to help us um, diagnose the disease and develop a treatment. So they're a key part of what we do. Of course, the families are a key part because a lot of times the patient can't consent. So they're very helpful for assistance in things like surveillance and research. And of course, you're a voice for a government and funding agencies. They don't want to hear from us. They know that we have a conflict of interest. You know, we want to keep ourselves funded. But if you go to your representative as a constituent of their, of their jurisdiction, you vote for them or you won't vote for them, they're going to take you seriously. And they want to know whether or not that CJD funding is important for people that they represent. And it really provides motivation. So one of the pictures that I don't show is that at the CJD Foundation Conference, you'll have patient families sitting with the researchers, which is really cool. It's really cool for the families, but it really does provide a lot of motivation for the researchers who sometimes have never really seen anyone affected by CJD. And it really brings home the importance of their research. Then there's the CJD Foundation, which I really can't talk about because they really do everything with us. 
and they're a very key partnership. We wouldn't be doing what we're doing without them. Um, for example, keeping us funded by going to Capitol Hill, but they really help us in all things and we're really, really grateful. And this is probably one of my favorite pictures because it's some of my favorite people in the world in this picture. And they're from around the world. So you have my wife and I, you also have Debbie and Lori from the CJD Foundation, Dr. Richard Knight in the middle who works at the Surveillance Center in Scotland. And then you have Christiane who's standing next to Debbie, who is the center manager for the CJD uh, Surveillance Center in Australia. And then of course, David and Suzanne who run the Patient Advocacy Organization in Australia. Um, it really, when you leave the CJD Foundation Conference, you definitely get this picture that everyone is working together, which I can say you don't always get that working in other fields. So it's really important, I think, helpful to see that, especially as a family member. So in summary, um, the Surveillance Center serves a key role in surveillance and research. We continue to expand and evolve as diagnostic processes and the disease itself and its threats evolve. Um, we like to think of ourselves as a platform for research. Of course, we do our own research, but I think more importantly is making sure that we can get da data and tissue and the researchers' right hands in order to help them with their important work. Um, we continue to build our relationships to serve the Prion community. And we're really grateful for the support that you, the families, and the CJD Foundation has offered us over the years. So with that, this is a center of some of the CJD uh, Surveillance Center staff, and we thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to move on to the panel question and answer. Uh, again, this will not be recorded, so uh, don't be concerned about uh, having any personal information recorded, but do know that uh, other people will hear what you say who, who are on the call at present. Thank you very much.